So, that song, beautifully, beautifully sung, Del. So, yeah, really beautiful song. So the last line, not the last line of the song, but one of the last lines in each verse, do you like you? Do you like yourself? I took a walk this morning with my dogs, which I do every Sunday morning, just to think about what today's message is, what, what, what it is. And I have to say, it made me very emotional because I had to ask myself, do I like me? What about myself do I like? What don't I like? Sometimes it's much easier to, to, to do the list of what I don't like. Don't you find that? What don't I like? Well, blah, blah, what do you like? I'm nice. <laughs> so, you know, the real question is, when don't you like you? Like, when don't you like you? How easy is it to derail you? How easy is it for you to suddenly get on the wrong side of your life? How quick do you turn? Is, are you going to waste the rest of the day worrying about that opening? Good. Yeah, that's the right answer. Because it was perfect. Absolutely perfect for what this song is all about. And yet, I know people, I know I was one of them, who one little mistake can derail me for the day, the week, the month, whatever. I remember um, in West Side Story, yes, I did that show on Broadway. <laughs> um, during pre, on Broadway, thank you. <laughs> Directed by Jerome Robbins, thank you. So um, anyway, to the point of what I'm saying, uh, in rehearsal and in previews on Broadway at the Minskoff Theater, the night before opening for the first time ever, I fell on my, in my knee slides right at the end of Cool. There's this big thing in the, in, in the end of Cool where you do these knee slides across the sta stage and you end there, like, like with your legs open and your knees down. Well, I did the knee turns and fell. Now, I am front and center. Everyone else is behind me, as it should be. And... <laughs> And they're uh, playing riff, of course. And so there I am on the ground. <laughs> I am on the ground, and I can only tell you, as brilliant as I may have been for the rest of the show, or up to that point, didn't matter. My entire identity was that I fell in the knee slides the night before our opening night. So going into the opening night with every critic in town, Lauren Bacall, Rock Cuts, and all these amazing people there for this big opening, the last thing I did was fall. And I had to go into opening night like that. And I wish there was a video of opening night because I know that, that I built that entire first act to that moment. It was like, I'm, I wasn't even there. I was just waiting for that moment. And I remember when I did those slides and nailed it, my face, which I shouldn't have been smiling at that point, because <laughs> Riff was intense, and I'm like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the consummate actor back then. So, so when don't you like you? And when do you like you? Do you like yourself more when you're having a good hair day? Notice these are all personal to me. Do you like yourself better when you've put on this brand new outfit, this amazing outfit that you know you look great in? Does that, do you like yourself better then? Do you like yourself better when you're wearing a new pair of shoes, which I just happen to be doing today? <laughs> do you like yourself better when you have some great watch on, some brand new watch, or ladies or men, some beautiful new earrings? Do you like yourself better when you finally are wearing diamonds? Do you like yourself better from the outside in? And then what has to happen? This is a big one. What has to happen for you to really like yourself? What has to happen in your world for you to really like yourself? Do you have to be successful? To really like yourself, do you have to be very successful? Do you have to have more than, right, Kelly Lang? Is, you're answering yes to all of this, right? Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do, you have, do, you, do you have to be like the, the highest paid woman in television news history at the time in order to like yourself? Is that what it took? <laughs> Shoes, the Gucci bag. How many houses have you owned? Yeah. 
to how many houses do you have to own before you land in the one that actually says it's okay to just be you, which is the house you have, by the way. So success, do you have, do you have to wait till you lose enough weight to like yourself? Do you have to wait till you're in the perfect body type? <laughs> I love all the laughing I'm hearing, right? <laughs> to like yourself enough? What is, it, what is it gonna take? Do you have to have that big hit TV series where you are the star, the writer, the producer, and it's the way you want it done to really like yourself? That's mine. Yeah, Kel now Sherry's like, that's exactly right, <laughs> right? Does it have to be that someone says something nice to you? Do you need to be acknowledged out here in order to like yourself more? And I know I'm making fun of this a little bit, but these are really important questions to ask and to answer. Do you have to have lots of money to like yourself more? Do you have to really have money to like yourself? So what about what's already happened in your life, your history? You know, do you, have to, do you have to have worked through all that pain to like yourself? Do you have to work through all those, those, those things that happened to you in your life in order to really like yourself? I was that. I did this. This happened to me. How can I like that? Do you have to work all of that out? Does it have to be done? Have you, has, have you had to go through 20 years of therapy to get to the other side of ick to uh? <laughs> and then are you okay with uh? Do you like that? Are you willing to like it? Are you willing to like it no matter what? Do you have to let go of all the resentments in order to like yourself more? I find in myself that if something comes up or someone comes up and I have a feeling in my heart about them that I don't like, that isn't the most loving, that isn't the most love only, forgive everything moment in my life, it doesn't feel good. I don't like myself for that. And yet, can I just be okay with that? That's a feeling. That's something that's coming through me for whatever reasons, probably their fault. <laughs> Can't I just be okay with that? Can't I just allow that? K Kelly said such a great thing during meditation this morning. He said, I want to invite you all today, if your mind is racing or if something comes through you or something derails you or something distracts you, let it. And just keep moving on. Stay in the meditation. Let it. Allow it. Do I have to really figure all that out before I'm willing to like myself? Do I have to make sense out of all the things I've failed at in order to really like myself? Or am I walking through this life of mine uh, an amalgamation of everything that's happened to me? All the failings, all the successes. Have I somehow taken all of that and found a medium to live in, a place where it's, okay, so that happened, this happened, I'm good, I'm okay. That's where we get to the, how's it going, huh? So-so, everything's okay. That's not the life we were brought here to live. And the idea of liking ourselves conditionally is not what love is. Love is unconditional. Real love is unconditional. The kind of love that allows for everything the kind of love that lets you off the hook, even when you don't think you should be let off the hook. That's what love does. And love is a synonym for God, according to Ralph Waldo Emerson. And that's the kind of love I'm talking about. Not just liking yourself, loving yourself. Unconditionally, none of that matters. None of what happened two seconds ago matters because of who you are and you are unconditional love. I mean, <laughs> the talk title today is Tried and True. Tried and True. You all know what that means, right? When something's tried and true, the definition of it is this, tested and found to be reliable, trustworthy, good. Do you get it that sometimes we live our lives where we're just testing ourselves over and over and over again? Testing ourselves to see, am I really God? Like we talk about in church. Am I really perfect? Am I really this creative energy that's flowing through me? Am I really this? I'm gonna test it out and see if I can prove it. And we spend our lives trying to prove the very truth that we are. So Thanksgiving, um, my 
my uh, brother came in for, for Thanksgiving dinner. I have not seen my brother uh, at my house. He has not come to my house with his two children. One was 13, 12, and one was nine, and uh, Sean and Molly. And they have not been in my house in, well, 13 years. That Neither child has ever been in my house. And they live in Fresno. So for some reason, he wanted to come for Thanksgiving this year. Now, they go to a very conservative Christian church. And when I say conservative, I'm being conservative. <laughs> it is just very radical in terms of what they believe. And, the, and there's, he's divorced from his wife, so their mom married someone even more radical. So the kids were all talking, and you know, we have 26 people at our dinner table, and my nephew got up and gave a, gave a little, everybody gave a talk. <laughs> everybody had to give a little few moments of what they were grateful for. And when got, he was last, he ended up being last, my nephew. And when he stood up, my brother kind of made a joke and said, said, come on, you know you can do it. And then he turned around and gave the most eloquent talk where he said, I'd like you all to take a breath for a moment <laughs> and just take this all in. <laughs> I hadn't even said that. <laughs> and we're all just looking at him. And then he said what he said, and he said something about, something to the effect of a world where religion doesn't matter. I thought, wow, that's coming out of his mouth, knowing what, what he... So the next day, we were sitting around talking, and my brother, unfortunately, asked me the question in front of them, what do, well, what does your religion believe? And I thought... Do I really go into this right now in front of the kids? Do I, I don't wanna, I don't want to say anything negative or that would make them feel like I'm thinking they're wrong or they're thinking I'm wrong. So I said, well, let me ask you this. Where is God? And Sean went, God is everywhere. I said, that's the exact right answer. Where are you? He said, well, I'm right here. I was like, okay, so if God is everywhere and you're right here, Aren't you part of everywhere? And doesn't that mean somehow God is you? And he went, he looked at his father, he went, you know that makes sense. <laughs> and, so, and so Craig said, look, we, I've watched your talks. He said, I have a hard time with the I am God thing. I said, but if you're not God, what are you? I mean, really, what are you? If you're not God, what are you? And both of the kids were like. <laughs> and... Um, and the conversation went up from there in a good way. And my brother was very honest. He said, well, honestly, the life I've lived up to this point, I can't even fathom the idea that I'm God. And it really made me think. It made me sad, and then it made me think about all of us. The problem with I am God is that we think we're something else. We think that we have to try to be God. And the lyrics of this song is, you don't have to try, try, try and they just go on forever. You don't have to try, 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 try. Uh, uh, you don't have to try, 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 try. Uh, uh, you don't have to try. You don't have to try, 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 try. Uh, uh. That's the lyrics to this song. They're eloquent. <laughs> just try, try, try. Because I think she wants to get a po the point across that we are wasting our lives trying to be what we already are. And that's the philosophy you've signed up for. That's the belief you've signed up for. That's what Ernest Holmes began in 1927 when he wrote the book, years before that, when he was a little boy. And his mother said, we're not taking you back to that, that, that Protestant church because they keep telling us we're bad and I just know we're not. That's where he got it. He got it from a mother that pulled them out of a church that kept telling them they were less than, that they were worms of the dust. And Ernest Holmes took that moment, I believe, in time and said, well, if we're not, what are we? Asked the question and propelled his entire life into teaching and writing about the science of mind. But it didn't stop there. It didn't. Because when he died, he was saying, he actually went all the way from, we are not worms of the dust, all the way to, I am God. This is what we are. We have to take it from there. And what I'm now thinking is we have to stop trying to be God and actually be God. What do you have to do to get all that crap out of the way in order to be who you are? Really. So I have a story. Um, 
Kevin and I went to Barcelona one year for, for a vacation, and right before vacation, I thought I'd get my hair trimmed. And so I went to the hair, the barber, the barber, as if I would go to a barber. I went to the <laughs> hairstylist, and, and the hair cutter, hairstylist, I said, you know what, I just cut it a little bit shorter this time. I, I want something a little punky, because I'm going to Barcelona. Well, he cut the worst haircut I've ever had in my life. I looked like, you remember the cartoon Dondi? I could not get the hair up, because there was no hair. I looked horrible, and when I went home, I was literally sick to my stomach. I was like, oh my God, this is impossible. How could this have happened to me? I look horrible. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the man I was, and this is just awful. It was like this whole Samson problem. And so I show Kevin, and Kevin's like, oh, you got your hair cut. And I'm like, I didn't get a haircut. I got massacred. And it was just so depressing, and I was depressed. And we're on our way to Barcel Barcelona for the most amazing romantic vacation of our life, and I am depressed. Every single place I walked by, there was some image of me, a, a window, a, a, a door. I was like, oh, oh, it was awful. Kevin tried to take pictures, but don't take any pictures. Now, this is true. I tell on myself because it really did. It destroyed the first couple days of my vacation until a woman at a barista says to me as I'm checking out, she said, oh my God, I love your haircut. I was like, really? <laughs> she said, yeah, it's really cool. It really frames your face, great. And I love the color of your hair. I love all that salt and pepper. I was like, thank you. Suddenly my vacation got a little better. <laughs> and when I was thinking about this this morning, I was like, oh my God, how often does this happen to us in life? We live from the outside in. We let things affect us in such a way that we don't like ourselves anymore. I don't like myself because I got this horrible haircut. To this day, I have issues with haircuts. Right, Barbara? Yeah. I go, <laughs> I literally go to this hair cutter that I love now, and, and, and if I can't get to her, I will grow this out until it's a rat's nest before I let anybody else touch it. Because I'm that clear, I like nice hair. So, um, speaking of my hair, which is very important, uh, I had an actor once say to me in an audition, as I was in a final callback, and this actor turned to me and says, you know, if you didn't have that hair, I don't know who you'd be. Because I had hair like down to here at the time, flowing and wavy, and I was like, what's that, what? And he was like, no, you really identify with that hair. Everybody identifies with that hair that you have. And I was, he was like, I bet if you cut it off, you'd be lost. I was like, how dare you? I will never cut this off. <laughs> But I look back on all this stuff and I think, oh my God, this is actually how my life had been prior to Science of Mind when I really started getting a better sense of who I was. Yesterday, Kevin and I are finally putting everything back and pulling things out of the trunk, out of the garage. There was a stack of pictures of me, as you can only imagine, <laughs> in my back. And I pulled out one and I just, there was this amazingly handsome, sexy, young, there wasn't a line on that face, just this beautiful picture. And I remember when that picture was taken, thinking to myself, oh, this isn't really, uh, I, I can do better. And now I'm looking at it going, oh, come back to me. <laughs> and I showed it to Kevin and I said, how could I have ever, ever thought that I was unattractive? And I don't mean that in an ego way. I mean that in a truthful way. How could you, how could I today? I know I'm going to look back at this when I'm 90 and say, bring it back to me. <laughs> but maybe today I think I look older, somehow. I was dating a photographer at one point in New York City, and um, he was this amazing photographer. And one night he said to me, now remember, back then they didn't have cameras that like the picture, you saw the picture. He, he, I just trusted. And so he said, no, no, you look great. Just, just, just sit in there, sit in that chair. He took all these pictures. About two weeks later, he produces the worst ever picture of me with like, my hair was all over the place. I had acne like you wouldn't believe. It was a horrible picture. And I was like, are you kidding me? This is your idea of you look good? Because if you think I look good like this, I'm worried now. And I gotta tell you, it's one of my favorite shots of me now at 63. Because I look back and I think, that's who I really looked like. 
when I wasn't trying so hard to look like something else. And what I think that man meant at that time was, I see something, my eyes were aglow. I, I see something in you that looks so great. Let's capture that. So I want you to ask yourself, what, what's really, really going on in you that could stop you from liking yourself? What, what, what possibly could, could, could happen that it would derail or change who you truly are? So my final thought for you is this. What if you liked yourself no matter what? What if you decided today to like yourself no matter what? No matter what anyone said, no matter what anyone did, no matter what you did, no matter what you've done, no matter what you may do, no matter what. Because when you look at tried and true, I think we need to get away from the tried part of it and get to the true part of it. Because there is a spiritual truth, as Ernest Holmes tells us, and that spiritual truth is the center of your being. That's who you really are. And what I have finally found out is that when you live from the inside out, and Nina Marjani talked about this last week, when you live from the inside out, then the outside in, that's a breeze. When you know who you are, nothing can derail you. And when you know who you are so profoundly that nothing can derail you, that's when you recognize who you are. So here you go. This week, as you go through the rest of this week, one question. Do you like you? Give it a thought. Namaste.